I also managed to watch Shane Gillis on SNL and I really did enjoy it. I'm not going to lie. I saw Shane Gillis perform on SNL and I really did enjoy his opening monologue. I enjoyed most of the skits. I think I've got through about half of the skits. I haven't got through the entirety of it, but I thought his opening monologue was really good. Um, I thought it was quite refreshing to see him nervous. I'm not going to lie. Um, it was good to see somebody do those monologues and it looked like it was a big deal to him. And you can tell he's a real fan of comedy because he was legitimately taking in everything around him. He pointed to his mum and dad in the crowd and stuff. He had other family members there. That must have been a really sweet moment especially when you consider everything that happened with him right in terms of his snl career in terms of him getting hired the first time around and then getting fired because um that joke come about where he said something a bit dicey about asian people and shit to come back around and be hosting snl um especially at the level that he's at i think the patreon last time i checked um he's matt and shane's my secret time for his podcast i think the patreon was like making half a million dollars per month or something it might be one of the top um you know making revenue making flipping um patrons out there which is flipping incredible so he's come back on paid he's come back onto snl and his career is a much better place he's just got a series greenlit with netflix he had a special on flipping netflix everything's looking rosy so it was pretty nice just to see him on stage doing his shit i'm not gonna lie i really did flip and enjoy it but there are some people out there that didn't enjoy it there are some people out there that basically say he bombed. I don't personally think he did. I personally think he had a typical stand-up comedian's performance. He started off a bit shaky, especially with being live TV, um, especially being a big deal, that kind of platform. But then he kind of, you know, saved himself and kind of got back onto the horse and was pretty okay by the first, by the next, you know, after the first two minutes, he was pretty fine. I personally think so. So I think the bomb thing was, was a, a bit of an overreaction. And I'm not sure about you, but... I actually like it when comedians it's like um i always relate comedy to fucking djing but when you go and see a dj play sometimes or even when you listen to a dj mix it's nice when they clang it's kind of nice when they fuck up because you know they're human oh sometimes you fuck up sometimes it doesn't all go to plan sometimes you're playing vinyl and the flipping the needle skips and shit like that's all part of the fun of the night or sometimes you're so drunk or high behind the decks, you press um, pause on the wrong one and you press on the one that's meant to be playing and the crowd sometimes makes some noise about that. That's all part of the fun. So people were getting annoyed that he kind of looked nervous and he was kind of stuttering or he fat sounded like he had a frog in his throat. Like, what do you expect, man? It's like primetime TV. I think SNL, if I'm not mistaken, is on Saturday, right? Ends the name Saturday Night Live. It's always filmed live in front of a live audience. Um, he mentioned it in a stand-up special, in a stand-up he did on the monologue, that it's also under some super bright lights. What did you expect? Of course, it's going to be nerve-wracking. So I wasn't you know i wasn't perturbed by that but some people were and one of the people that were perturbed by it is this writer courtesy of vulture and um, the title is anatomy of a fail right so this writer from vulture was not a fan of shane gillis at all let's see what he had to say about shane gillis's opening monologue which i absolutely love by the way i absolutely loved it let's see what he has to say shane gillis made his return on saturday night live this weekend last weekend sorry now um the role of the host five years after being fired for his very brief stint as co-member due to the series of racist homophobic and sexist joke he had made on podcasts it's been five years that's pretty cool you know to say to for him to achieve because five years isn't a long time for him to achieve everything he's achieved with the podcast which um what you call it with matt mccusker and shit and everything he's done on, on, on his own is pretty decent in that five-year time he went in, he went to work instead of kind of moping around feeling sorry for himself and grifting he basically went to work created a really popular podcast made it really funny everybody kind of latched onto it and then he kind of built it from there pretty amazing to see in five years what he's done in the days since, the discourse on social media and in comment section has fallen into a pattern that's become predictable when quote-unquote unf offensive comedy is involved. Critics say that he struggled through a monologue that was tone-deaf and mean, while his fans argue that he crushed by forcing his uptight audience to hear some bad words. But it really isn't a matter of free speech, political correctness, or even co um, council culture. Schengen is simply bombed. I don't think that's true, personally. Again, this is probably one of the hardest things to write about stand-up comedy maybe similar again to djing like how can you say somebody have had a bad set it's all just personal preference it's all just like what mood were you in what size what, what type of things do you find funny like do you have do you already have um an agenda about him anyway in the first place do you already have a narrative about him in the first like all those things kind of play a role into how you review things so it's hard to kind of give an unbiased review of a stand-up comedian especially if you come at it from this kind of way but let's continue 
Gillis is not the first person to host SNL and attempt to do a, pers a potentially um, controversial material. Louis C.K. talked about child molestation in 2015. That might be still one of the best opening monologues of SNL history. That Louis C.K. one where he talks about um, flipping paedophilia. And basically makes a joke of like, oh, um, paedophilia is one of those things that's like abhorrent in society. We all know it's like a scarlet letter. You do it, you get caught and it's like you're finished socially, but people keep doing it. So it must be really good. You know what I mean? Like that's kind of the joke he makes. And I remember listening to it for the first time and my jaw was on the floor, man. And like, obviously he made it way funnier than how I made it. But that Lucy K monologue of 2015 might be one of the greatest of all time. I swear to God. Chris Rock talked about how he'd never gone to the Freedom Tower in 2014. Dave Chappelle, after the 2016 election, talked about how he was going to give Donald Trump a chance. Bill Burr railed against white women in 2020 and 2023. Zach Galifianakis said a joke, I like dark comedians. That's why I like the Wayne Brothers. <laughs> Sorry, that's an incredible good line in it, right? Big up Zach Galif Big up Zach Galif Galifianakis, right? How do you pronounce his fucking name, right? Big up Zach. I like dark comedians. That's why I like the Waning Brothers. Do you know how good of a line that is? That is fucking genius writing comedy, that is, isn't it? Um, just over a year ago, Woody Harrelson used his monologue to offer up some COVID-19 conspiracies. Some of those host monologues generated backlash on the next day, but they caught or killed it on the night. For better or worse, those hosts got away with it. That's the art. Uh, that's what Gillis, Gillis failed to do. Um, Gillis's monologue made me think of the Anthony Jeselnik 2023 appearance on Fear of Wounds this past weekend. All these comics now, it's like almost a point is to get in trouble. It's like, why are you giving me this shit? I'm a comic. I'm allowed to say whatever I want, Jeselnik explained. That's wrong as far as I'm concerned. He then offers a quote from Andy Warhol. Art is getting away with it. You can talk about sensitive issues like sexuality or disabilities, but the audience needs to leave happy. That's art, Jeselnik added, otherwise you're just a troll. I find it funny how these kind of woke journalists are using Anthony Jeselnik as like one of their guys to kind of rally against. He wasn't talking about people like, um, what you call it? He wasn't talking about people like um, Shane Gillis at all. Shane Gillis doesn't try to like be naughty for the sake of it. He just wants to be funny and say like funny shit. And if you know his style of comedy, you know what he did on that monologue is basically what he talks about on the podcast. It's what he does on stage. It's no different. He's not trying to like, you know, purposely poke and prod at people. So this is a very strange thing that they're basically using as defense but again we continue some fans online were just excited that gillis said the r word and gay on snl others seemed to relish that the audience and the band behind him didn't enjoy it yeah that was good as all well, by the way i'm not gonna lie i think the woman there's a woman on his like left left shoulder behind him that kind of looked like she was trying her best not to laugh but everybody else kind of had like a deadpan face they weren't enjoying it in the slightest i've got to be honest um maybe when he started to talk about his um um his relatives with like down syndrome and shit then it's had to kind of it soften then when he then when he dropped that his sister adopted black kids you know what i mean like he's got some stuff there that kind of gave him some bonus points but the band members were looking a bit stone-faced they had that andres um andrea Pereira face you know what i mean um Let's continue. They celebrate him by uh, they celebrate him being a troll on a bigger stage, but that's the misread of Gillis's comedy. He's not a troll comedian. He doesn't just throw inflammatory words into the act for the shock or get his rise out of the audience. Rather, he's getting away with it, comedian. He has the ability to get audiences to laugh at ideas they don't agree with or words they don't agree with for being used in a self-deprecating and a personal uh, personal perspective. And that ability to walk the line is what has earned him fans from all over the comedy spectrum pulling off the sensitive dance demands that the audience trust the comedian and part of the trust comes from a sense of assuredness that the comedian knows what they're doing part of the reason gillis's material doesn't go over well at snl is that it does um as it does this uh, no no put it, let's start again Part of the reason why Gillis's material doesn't go over well in SNL as it does in his stand-up specials is that during his SNL monologue, he visibly was n nervous on stage. He awkwardly has um, to wait a couple of seconds too long for someone to bring him the mic, then stammers through his first joke, which is a vague acknowledgement of the controversy of his 2019 SNL firing and hiring. This, the joke doesn't work, probably because fewer people in the audience actually know the details of what happened, of the joke would suggest, and Gillis does by does by telling people not to Google something is create a distraction, um, intrigue, and off-kilter energy. To be fair, this person does have a point. I'm not going to lie. 
I think that f- the microphone thing is dumb. I, I don't think it was that long. I think they're exaggerating about the hand mic. The passing of the microphone is weird. Um, I actually found out odd anyway that they didn't. They don't let you bring out the microphone in your hand. He cut. You come out on SNL on the stage. You get your applause. You do your little waves, and you're like, "Thank you, thank you for being here." And then somebody slowly, ha- like, quietly hands you the mic at the front row. Why didn't just give it to you in your hand and then just turn it on when you're about to speak? It's not that difficult, do you know what I mean? But they, I don't know why they do it that way. But anyway, um, I think he didn't need to mention the 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 controversy at all. He could have just probably alluded to it like, it's nice to be back, you know? And then people would have laughed and not would have laughed, you know what I mean? And just kind of rolled on with that or just not acknowledge it at all. But I think the way he kind of tried to like, you know, suggest that, oh, everybody must know about this contract. It's like, not really, you know what I mean? Um, even though it was a big deal to you, it probably wasn't a big deal to most people and probably most people don't even know who he is. So it probably wasn't necessary to kind of go down that route. But again, I don't think it was that bad. The energy extends into his next bit when he delivers a punchline around 110 mark during his high school football coach joke when um, even though you hear laughter in a clip, Gillis is awkwardly pauses, laughs and or says all right to himself. The set continues and he gets the occasional punchline but he fails to build a rolling laughter found in any of the good stand-up. Then there's the moment where he points to his father in the audience and mocks how his volunteer assistant girls high school basketball coach. I'm sorry but that was fucking funny. When he kept pointing to his dad and saying that his dad was a volunteer assistant girls high school ba- basketball coach, that was fucking hilarious. Like, come on. That was really funny. <laughs> Basically calling your dad a pedo without calling him a pedo. That was fucking brilliant. Like, let's see that. Especially the ridiculousness of the role. Volunteer assistant girls high school basketball coach. Like, that's a hilarious title. <laughs> It sounds like people in the studio are laughing, but Gillis reacts to the camera like it fully bombs, saying, I thought that was funny. Later in the set, he says, I can see everyone not enjoying it. You see, that's the thing about stand-up. If you just keep writing, repeating the jokes and just writing them down, it doesn't, of course, it doesn't sound funny. Like, come on, man. This writer's fucking on a mad one. I thought it was funny later on the set. He says, I can see everybody not enjoying it. Just the most nervous I've ever been. It's surprising no one told him beforehand to act like he was killing it no matter what. Part of the probably... How are you going to tell a comedian what to do and how to be funny on stage? He should just pretend like he was killing it. What, like fucking Burt Kreischer? Just keep laughing at your own jokes. Mic slapping your... You know, uh, do a little mic knee slap. What are you talking about, bro? Sometimes if it's not going well, it's not going well. You can't just like maniacally like convince yourself that it's going okay like that's psycho behavior part of it is probably a lack of confidence (laughs) most episodes of snl start with a person literally doing stand-up for the first time and it works because first the stars know how to to be poised on tv this is the risk of asking someone to host who has no tv experience gillis was even more uncomfortable during the live sketches where he struggled to read cue cards now i I think he smashed the live sketches personally i think this person's his person's bugging out Gets his early monologue stumbles where um, where were, were from set sorry was stumbles were from the safe easy stuff that was supposed to get the audience on board for his dicey material later dicey uh, yeah dicey dicey but now but how he plays it off it seems forces him to his position of trying to win the audience back when he arrives at the down syndrome section it doesn't get the reaction he expects he defensively jokes look i don't have any material that could be on tv it's similar to joy Coy blaming the golden globe writers during his monologue but in this case gillis is blaming himself it's not that the jokes weren't necessarily bad gillis just didn't succeed in attempting to tell them to his audience unlike the globes the SNL audience is excited to see comedy so all the host needs to do is to, with the monologue is convey why they should be there and that it's going to be a fun show and gillis both explicitly and inexplicitly told the audience he shouldn't have been there and it wasn't come on man this is pure hate this is pure hate this is pure hate um i think this is overboard i think gillis smashed it on the sketches my favorite one of his was definitely the hr one i thought the hr sketch was incredible so funny i laughed throughout the entire thing um i think he's a really good comedic actor in my personal opinion i think you've seen it from his sketches you see it from the other show that he did i forgot the name of it um but he's done quite a few bits and pieces online and you can tell this guy has good comedic acting chops so i think he was perfect for um snl and it, and if anything this snl appearance made me realize why they even booked him in because i think in 2015 when he got announced for snl i didn't realize i couldn't work out why because i wasn't really i wasn't that familiar with him you know so i was like huh interesting choice but now that he's done snl i now get what they saw in him 
Like, he's actually talented. Like, let's be real. Like, for the guys within the Jerry verse, like, if you want to tap in Jerry verse people, if you want to tap them up and if you want to use them for a project, a big project, there's not many within that JRV verse um, or extended universe who are any good outside of their comfort zone. Most of them can only perform in front of their home crowd. They can't really do anything else. They can't write. They can't do sketch comedy. They can't act. So you're kind of limited in what you can offer them, right? All you can offer them is what Bert did. You can just offer them a movie where you just like, you know, you play yourself basically, but they don't really have much range. And I think what Lewis, sorry, what Shane Gillis showcase is that he has a lot of range. He has a lot of comedic range. He's obviously very creative, um, very funny. Um, he can apply that in different environments and shit. I thought that was awesome. The one thing that I would love to hear from him, hopefully he does talk about, I don't think he will because I think he's going to be a lot more, I think he's from now on, Shane's going to be a lot more, I wouldn't say PC, but he's going to be a lot more careful about what he says when it comes to the industry people. But I would love to know what happened when he walked into the SNL studios and he saw Bo and Yang for the first time. What did Bo and Yang say? Did Bo and Yang like come over and, you know, talk to him? Did they kind of like, you know, uh, settle it, settle their issues? Like, I wonder what happened. Like, did he kind of ignore him? Did he just pretend like did nothing happened? Like, because Bo and Yang was super critical of um, Shane Gillis when he got fired from SNL. I think he was one of the people that was actually campaigning for him to get fired. So I would love to see or hear what Bo, how Bo and Yang was. Because now, you know, Shane Gillis' career is like on fire. He's probably making way more money than Bo and Yang is. He's probably way more famous than him, especially in comedic circles. So I wonder what that kind of dynamic, what that kind of vibe was like in the room. But I enjoyed it. I had a good time with it. Big up Shane Gillis. Um, absolutely smashed it. And obviously now off the back of that, he's also got his pilot for that show called Tires that he was doing, um, where he filmed the pilot episode for. He's got that green lit for, I think, five episodes or something on Netflix, which I'm sure was all part of this whole thing. I'm sure that was part of the whole rollout of getting SNL. was like, hey, you smashed it. Here's a fucking SNL deal and that's at the back of that and he's gonna be going to the fucking moon very very soon so big up shane gillis big up shane blood clark gillis